Hello there, I'm Jane Ransom, co-author of the book Ignite Your Leadership, and here with me is Michael Roberto. Michael Roberto is the trustee professor of management at Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island. He has served on the faculty of Harvard Business School and as a visiting professor at NYU's Stern School of Business. He teaches an executive management program in Japan. He has created two best-selling audio and video lecture series for the great courses, the most recent of those being on transformational leadership, Professor Roberto has won several major teaching and research awards. He's the author of two highly acclaimed business books, Know What You Don't Know and Why Great Leaders Don't Take Yes for an Answer. Mike, it's really a pleasure to be able to interview you today. Welcome. Thanks, Jane. It's uh, great to be with you today. Great. Um, so as you know, uh, this is... Um, I want to talk today about igniting the leader within, you know, bringing out the, the leader inside, um, inside of us. And I wonder if I could ask you personally, um, in your role as a leader, as a teacher, and whatever other leadership roles you may have in your life, um, what ignited, when you look back on your life, what ignited the leader within you? What was one of those moments where you went, oh, I'm a leader, or I can be a leader, or I want to be... Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. I, I think that um, you certainly can go back to some experiences when you're young. And, you know, for me, I think the biggest influence was the fact that uh, my parents were uh, immigrants and um, they uh, did not read and write English when I was little. Um, and so I had to do a lot independently. Like, you know, my college search was totally done on my own, like much, to not much of a search. It wasn't, you know, like today, but, but you know, uh, picking classes in high school, deciding what activities to do, later on my job hunt you know when I left college I could talk to them about it but that wasn't something they were going to be able to advise me the way I perhaps could advise my kids I think that being independent at a very young age on all those decisions showed me hey I I can do this you know and, and, and I think that was really helpful to me later in life that that's um very impressive and that makes sense to me and how did that translate within you because I understand that right out your independence how did that translate into then leading others for you? Yeah, so I think then, you know, what it really became about, I think that's why and you see it in some of my writing. I'm a big believer in the best leaders are the ones who, it's not just that they empower others, right? Yeah. They really, you know, there's this great expression we use in teaching. Um, I think it originally came from Teddy Roosevelt. I might be wrong on this, but it's the notion that they won't care what you know until they know that you care. Right. And, uh, and I really think that, getting to know like the team around you, understanding what are they good at? What are their talents? We want to figure out, I mean, the best leaders are the ones who figure out how to leverage those really effectively. Right. And so um, I think you want to get people excited. Um, what you do is give them an opportunity to use the talents that they value the most themselves. Right. But first that means you got to figure out what those are as a leader. And uh, so I lead a big program here on campus and, uh, you know, I built a, a dedicated team. We've been together five years. The fact that no one's left the team, they all have stayed, like it's to me, you know, because it's something they do on top of their normal teaching duties. I think one of the reasons is because I've given them, A, it's an exciting shared vision that we all share, but also each person's role is we try to tailor it to what they really are good at and enjoy. That makes a lot of sense. Um, playing to people's strengths and... Um, you do write about leadership as empowering others. And you also talk about um, how the best leaders, you know, invite dissenting opinions, they're problem finders rather than just problem solvers. And so they've, they've really got to have that openness to what other people might consider ne negativity, you know, the conflict and so on. For someone who didn't grow up as you did, needing to be so independent, um, how could someone, because it's easy to say, right? And I know you're into experiential learning. How does a person actually change themselves to be, to be that leader who can really authentically welcome dissent and look for yeah. problems? <laughs> it's hard to do, by the way. You know, none of us are great at it, right? Yeah. None of us are great at it. Because the more capable you are, the more strongly you hold your own views, right? And so that becomes difficult. So I think... Um, it's really important. I think it starts 
with finding someone you trust who can be a bit of a sounding board, right? It's easier to start with someone who you really trust and who, you know, whose opinion you value and, and getting them to challenge you or to offer you a different perspective. It's going to be a lot more comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one setting with someone like that than it is to go into a team you're leading, maybe a team you've just started leading and trying to behave that way. It's going to be much more difficult to do. So I think, I think it's really important. I think, and there's some evidence, you know, in the research that shows some, some really good um, entrepreneurs out in Silicon Valley, for example, um, have sort of uh, a sort of confidant, you know, an experienced counselor is what Kathy Eisenhower calls them, that they can tap into. Um, and that, that, that's a sort of safe space where you can have someone dissent and challenge you, but they're not doing it in front of your whole organization, you know? And so I think it starts with that finding that confidant that you can build rapport with and whose, value, whose opinion you value. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. And I don't see that as something talked about a lot. I know others do talk about it. And you describe that role, um, of course, when you're talking about Kennedy's um, evolution, you yeah. know, from Bay of Pigs to Cuban Missile Crisis. Would you like to share a story of somebody relying on a confidant or confidence, either that one or some other story that comes to you? Yeah, so, so certainly the, the, the Kennedy story is a really interesting one, right? Um, I write about it in one of my books uh, in that, and I had a chance to learn a lot about this by, by interviewing Robert McNamara some years ago. Um, and what happened there, you know, is John Kennedy makes this terrible decision in his first three months in office, and then he reaches out, not only to his advisors, but even to former President Eisenhower, and they meet, and he sort of says, hey, what are we going to do differently? And, and one of the things he does, you know, is, is really use Ted Sorensen and Bobby Kennedy very effectively in the missile crisis in 1962, not only as confidants, but also as devil's advocates within his team and worked really well. It was very, very effective. But yeah, I've met a number of leaders who, who've tried to tap into this now. And, um, and, I, and I think what they're trying to do, right, is, is make sure that, uh, you know, it's so easy for us to get trapped. Psychologists call this problem the confirmation bias. We have a pre-existing view of the world and we look for data that will confirm what we already believe. Like we've all been living this during the election, right? Either read the New York Times or you watch Fox News, right? Right. You choose what you absorb based on your pre-existing views. And as leaders, that's dangerous, right? That's really dangerous when making decisions. So um, I think the best leaders recognize that and say, okay, I got to make sure I have another voice in the room or voices you yeah. know, who, um, who can do that. And, uh, They've got to be someone you trust, mm -hmm. but also got to be somebody that the team trusts. Uh, that you don't want them marginalizing that person. Right. But they've got to actually value the view too, right? It's really important. Yeah, yeah. And that also, I imagine you don't, because you don't want an us versus them, an in-group versus out-group feeling. And, you know, the, um, the, the Kennedy um, evolution story, which you do describe so well in your book, um, it, it's learning from failure, right? He goes and screws up Bay of Pigs, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but really learns from that failure. And you write a lot about how failure is something to welcome, to embrace, to learn from, to combine with successes and compare with successes, to learn from. I wonder if you would be willing to share an example from your own leadership experience of a time when you failed and learned. Yeah, no, that's a great question, my God. Um, I will tell you that um, I you know, had an experience, um, which was, I think, really important in that uh, early in my teaching career, where, you know, things did not go the way I expected, you know, at all. And, um, and I will, I went through those stages, and I was like, like in denial, like, wait, I, I'm a good teacher. I know I am, you know, I had this track record. And, and this particular class didn't go well. And, it's really difficult. So, so it's, you know, it's not like you're trying something brand new and you fail. Like we've all done that. I you certainly right. tried things. That one is a little more, it's easier for us to wrap our brain around because it's something brand new. Okay. We stumbled, but if we were doing something which we think we're good at and we fail, right. That's really, really difficult. And um, so it helps in those kind of cases, I think to, you know, how do you get over the denial? I mean, you kind of got to get slapped in the face a few times. <laughs> so it's really tough um, to do that. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I grappled with it for a while. I think what I did in that case was really go out and say, okay, what, what are a whole bunch of examples of people who've done this well? 
and uh, you know, not just rely on one mentor to say this is advice, but go out and just expose yourself to a whole bunch of people who've tackled that challenge and take bits and pieces, you know, as best you can. And then I think the big thing, and I write about this, is you, you gotta go out and try it. You can't think your way to a solution. To some extent, the only way you're gonna do it is learning by doing. And um, so I started trying some things. In fact, I remember um, deciding to, to, to do something pretty different with a course. Um, I was, I wanted to, I decided I was gonna teach a bunch of non-business case studies. Mm. To teach some really important leadership ideas. And at the time, this was like kind of risky. And I didn't, it turns out I started doing a ton of that. But at first I did just a little dabble into it. And, uh, and met with some students and got their feedback. And I got some positive feedback. I said, okay, that might be a pretty interesting way of tackling this. And you, so ex you, you, then you can start experimenting once, you, once you've exposed yourself to a range of ideas. And did you find, you do write a, about many different kinds of leadership in government and science in business. Um, so it's interesting to hear your evolution behind that. Um, would you have any advice for someone on how they could, you know, handle a fa failure like that uh, emotionally, like what to tell themselves, um, how to, uh, you know, we all know how to beat ourselves on the, <laughs> you know, on the head and say, yeah. and, and, but, and so you're offering good tactical advice, what to do, go out, find, you know, model other people and so on. Any advice for what to tell oneself in those situations? Well, I, you know, I think the one thing you have to think about is, um, you have to go back to say, did you have, uh, were your goals right? Mm. You know, were you, were, did you have the right goals and objectives? And I think um, sometimes we, we think we have a clear goal and objectives, but maybe we've, we've gotten off track. We've pursued certain goals that aren't really the important ones, you know? And um, so I think that's, it's important to sort that out. You know, why am I doing this? What's the real reason? If you do something for the right reasons, invariably, I think you, you, you figure it out and you get it right. Mm -hmm. Start doing things for the wrong reasons. And I think a little bit I got caught in that, you know, like, was I really doing it for the right reasons? Um, uh, and I mean, I teach because I love what I, I love what I do, right? And, mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on in academia and you can get sidetracked. Um, so important, that's important. I think the other thing is you have to, like, we spend a lot of time trying to fix our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think invariably we have to do that, but we also have to remember like, Hey, wait a second. Right? There's a reason why I got to where I am. Right. There's things I do well. And to some extent I can fix some weaknesses. To some extent I got to figure out what is the right game for me to play. Look, I'm five, seven. I'm never going to be an NBA player. I'm never <laughs> fixing that weakness because I can't control my height. There are things I can control and things I can't. So what can I control? Those weaknesses I need to fix. There's some, I'm stuck with them, right? I can't. <laughs> and there's some of those that are personality based too. Like there's just some things I'm not good at. Like you have to be willing to say, look, and I mean, we can all get better at everything, but there are some things we are probably more likely to be able to get better at than others, right? Yeah, yeah. And you did talk about playing to your strengths. I'm wondering um, also as somebody's maybe digging their way out of a failure and they, so they keep in mind, like, you know, play to their strengths and don't try to be great at everything. You, you talk about um, the importance of celebrating small wins to kind of build that confidence. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, Carl Weick wrote this great paper. He's a, a preeminent social psychologist and organizational theorist wrote this great paper back in 1984 about the power of small wins. And basically the notion being that we can have these big stretch goals. We can have these big problems we're trying to solve, but we need to um, identify the low hanging fruit, the small wins and celebrate them. And that they're really important because, and he goes to this emotionally, cognitively, mm. there's a whole lot, we can get overwhelmed by big problems and by difficult to achieve goals. So if we find some small wins, it can really help serve as a catalyst for us. So I'm a, I preach this all the time to my students. I'm a big believer in it. Um, yeah, I think it's really important, to, not, not just when you're recovering from failure, any effort you engage in. Yeah. Set yourself ambitious goals, but think about what your small win strategy is um, because that momentum you build will be so important, not just for yourself, but that's how you build allies. That's how you convince and persuade mm. others. You show them victories. 
Like you, it's hard to rally people on a team around a goal that's 18 months out, that's really ambitious. That, that sounds great and very motivating, but if you work six months and you've not seen how you're gonna achieve it, you feel like you're not making any progress, it's pretty easy for people to quickly get demotivated. But if you show them in those six months a few little small victories, people can rally around, they begin to believe in your vision. So I'm a big believer in it for leading your team too. Yeah, that makes sense. And also because you talk about the psychology that when goals as uh, you know, glorified as they may be, if they're too overwhelming to people, it actually reduces their motivation, right? Because they just don't feel competent to, to achieve them. Exactly, or or they think that uh, that that um, that someone's not being fair. Like, well, wait, you're not being fair to us. You really think you, we're going to be able to do that with the resources we have? How many times you sit in an organization, people gripe? Okay, yeah, great goal. We don't have the resources to achieve that. You, you know, we're, you haven't put us in a position to do that. And the whining and complaining, and, and some of it legitimate, right? I mean, mm-hmm. gosh, as a professor, we're great at whining about resources. <laughs> So you have to mitigate that, right? And one way you mitigate that is you, is you not just go after longing fruit when it appears, but you have to actually plan for it uh, ahead of time is what I would argue. Think ahead about what are the small victories you're going to go after. And uh, boy, you can get you can get a lot of people behind you if you can show them victories. Yeah, and you brought up uh, another issue here of fairness. And I, I know how important, you know, all kinds of... Um, neuroscience studies that find that people, um, as you know, will prefer to lose money over, you know, (laughs) just in the spirit of fairness, people hate to feel that they're being treated unfairly. Uh, What's some advice you give to people as leaders to to help others feel that they are being treated fairly? Yeah, so there's, you know, I, I read a lot about this idea of fair process, right? So it turns out people don't just care about the outcome or the results in an organization being fair. Uh, We certainly do care about that, but we care a lot about the process. So if you're trying to make a decision with a team, do they perceive that the process that you went through to make that decision was fair? And by fair, I mean, did you give them an opportunity to provide input? Did you listen carefully to their views? Um, did you uh, ex- explain yourself well and make it clear to them what the criteria were going to be for evaluating different proposals, right? If you, if you engage in a process that has those equity attributes, even if in the end you make a decision they may not agree with, they're much more likely to buy into it. And as leaders, this is key because when I talk about empowerment, engagement, uh, uh, welcoming dissent. I don't mean democracy in the workplace. I don't mean as a leader, at the end of the day, you say, okay, let's take a vote. What should we do? And if the team votes to do it, I'll do it. No, no, no. A leader ultimately says it's my call. That's why I've been put in a position of leadership. But before you do that, you want to make sure when I make that call, are people going to buy in and commit and align behind me, even if they disagreed with me? It turns out if you engage them in a fair process, they're much more likely to get behind you, even if they disagree. And I I think that's really important. That that happens, I think, all the time um, with uh, teams I'm on, not just teams I lead. I can think of some teams I've been on where uh, things have not gone my way, but I've worked really hard to implement the solution we came up with because I perceive the process to be fair. And then I think of other situations where, to me, it looks like a fait accompli the whole time, a whole bunch of meetings that, frankly, were a waste of time. And I feel like my voice wasn't heard. And boy, I'm less likely to run through a wall for that leader. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, you, in both cases, you know, the only difference is the process, not the outcome. Right. I, it, that's such an important point that you make about that almost more important than, or at, at least as important as arriving at the best decision is to be able to um, ensure implementation by keeping that process inclusive and fair and authentic, right? You talk about it's good to have a devil's advocate, but if it becomes just a ritual, uh, people will sense that it's inauthentic and that won't do it either. So I know it's often a, you know, an issue of really coming from an authentic place. And uh, you talk about how different kinds of people, personalities are called for in different kinds of situations, situational leadership. And you do uh, research and you do write about, you know, in business, science, government. Do you think anyone can learn to be a leader? 
Oh, it's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I, I, I'm not denying that some people are born with some pretty amazing abilities, talents, traits. Yeah. And they naturally kind of take on this, but I'm a big believer that we can develop as leaders. I, and the reason I say that is that, um, that I see over the course of four years with students, this tremendous development. So last semester uh, in the spring, uh, I taught a group of first year students and a group of seniors back to back. Wow. Okay. And night and day. And you see that and you say, wow, the development of this field. Now, why do they develop so much while they're here? One of the reasons is that we um, force them to not only be part of team projects, but to be leaders on team projects in different ways. And we, we put them through experiential learning where they, they have to take on things outside their comfort zone. But we give them some resources and skills. And, and now, does everybody become, you know, pick the leader you want to admire, Alan Mulally at Ford, or does everyone become, you know, uh, 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 Ed Catmull at Pixar? No. I mean, I understand, right? Some people have more natural talents at some of this. Some people just have more uh, comfort with being in front of a big room and, and, yeah. and a big team. But everybody can get better at it. So this is goes to, you know, Carol Dweck, the, the great... Um, oh, I love her. Yeah, so Stanford uh, psychologist who talks about fixed mindset and growth mindset, right? And what she says is that fixed mindset says, I'm not good at math, right? It views your abilities as fixed. A growth mindset says, you know, I, I, I want to learn more and I can learn more, has confidence that I might not be great at it today, but I can get better at it. And, and it welcomes a challenge in a way. Yeah. And so I'm a big believer in growth mindset. I, so I think even, yes, it might be that some of us have more natural abilities than others. But if we go in with a fixed mindset, well, then we, we're, we're toast, right? So, um, and what do the best leaders do? I mean, I look at some of the people that I know in business and education and others. They're, they're voracious consumers of information, not just from their own field, but from other fields. They're constantly looking for inspiration, ideas from elsewhere. What they're, what they're saying is I'm still growing as a leader, right? I mean, I think that's really cool. Bill Belichick, I know a lot of people don't like him, but I'm a New England Patriots fan. <laughs> Belichick is, is a voracious consumer of information from not just studying other football coaches, but just in general, right? He, he's a really, you know, intelligent, kind of inquisitive guy from everything I've understood about him. Um, and that's so important. What that says is even really good leaders, the ones, the best ones are the ones who they never stop learning and trying to improve. Right. And yeah. that also, that's really important because we can get caught in this sort of what I would call the sort of expert wisdom trap is we're a leader. We're really have a lot of expertise in some area and we suddenly decide that because of that, we're sort of the smartest person in the room, <laughs> except we're in this world that changes really rapidly. So that expertise can get outdated really quickly and we can be trapped by our own conventional wisdom. So that's, that's, I, I, by the way, I worry about that a lot because as a professor, like you really worry that like you never want the world to pass you by. Right. And so one of the biggest things I do is I try to get out of that ivory tower all the time. Yeah, so I spend a lot of time working with private sector companies, not just doing research, but other things. Because, boy, the worst thing that can happen is you you decide that because of your expertise that you stop learning about new things. Yeah, yeah. You know, another thing I, I like in your book is um, I can't remember which book it was, but um, that you talk about the um, the benefits of worrying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Healthy paranoia, I think, is what I call it. Um, yeah, you know, Andy Grove, uh, who just died recently, he was a longtime uh, CEO at Intel, uh, wrote a, most CEO books I'm not a fan of. They're often just, you know, let, let me tell you why I'm great kind of things. But his book, uh, one of his books was called Only the Paranoid Survive. It was an awesome book, right? And I think a, a little bit of healthy paranoia is kind of good. And I talk about how if you combine that with intellectual curiosity, you have, you have dynamite. Yeah. Right? You have that dynamite. And, um, that sounds easy to do. It's probably easier to do when you're 25, but when you're 45 or 55 or 65, it's a lot harder to do for yeah. some reason, right? It's a, you don't, you're not as paranoid and maybe you're not as curious anymore. Right, right. So it's a good you have to recalibrate. Right? Yes. And I know you've got an appointment coming up, <laughs> so, and I don't want you to be late for it. Um, so um, I'd love to 
keep talking with you, um, but I'm going to let you go to keep you from being late. So um, could you tell our viewers, uh, Mike, how they can find out more about you? Sure. Uh, so probably two easy ways to get a hold of me. I have a blog that I pretty regularly um, blog to, and then that has links to other resources. That's michael-roberto.blogspot.com. And I blog, I try to post to it, you know, three to four times a week, lots of leadership issues. Um, and then people can follow me on Twitter. It's Michael A. Roberto is uh, my Twitter handle. And so I usually tweet out a lot of the new blog posts that I put up and other links. So love to engage with folks. If, you, if people have questions, that's a great way to get a hold of me. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, your uh, bio and those uh, links uh, will also be here on this page for people to look at. Uh, so Thank you, Michael Roberto, for this interview. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us.